Welcome to the PR Maven podcast, a podcast all about growing your network and building your brand through traditional and digital networking techniques. I'm Nancy Marshall, the PR maven and CEO of Marshall Communications. I've been strengthening brands through PR for over 35 years, and now I'm celebrating the success of executives, influencers, business owners, and entrepreneurs from all around the world, all of whom have cultivated their brands and broadened their networks through traditional and digital networking methods. Each week, I interview one of these interesting and influential individuals and provide an opportunity for you, the PR Maven Nation, to gain insights from their strategies and stories. So stay tuned for this week's episode, and thanks for listening. Hello, PR Maven Nation. Welcome to the PR Maven Podcast, episode number 145, presented by Marshall Communications, creator of the Marshall Plan 65-step strategic process. For those of you new to the show, I'm your host, Nancy Marshall, the PR Maven and CEO of Marshall Communications. I want to welcome you, and I want to welcome our guest, who I'm very happy to have with here, with me here today, Phil Harriman. Thanks, Hi, Phil. Nancy. Thanks for having me. What a, what a treat. <laughs> it is a treat. It's nice to be here like online together. Although it, my preference is always to be in person. Me so too. Uh, I look forward to seeing you again in person. Yes. <laughs> Especially now that the pandemic has kind of wound down and we can get out and see people in person again. I can't wait for Independence Day. It's going to be quite a celebration, <laughs> literally and figuratively. Yeah, that's a very good point. I look forward to that, too. <laughs> so for over 40 years, hard to believe, but 40 mm. years, Phil Harriman has worked with hundreds of family-held and nonprofit businesses in the areas of retirement planning, business continuation planning, and estate planning. He started his career with Maine Governor James B. Longley's insurance agency in 1977. And I remember that, too, because I actually was uh, volunteering in the state legislature at that time while I was in high school. So I, I remember James Longley, you know, when in Augusta. So um, it's, I didn't know you were there, too, Phil. <laughs> In 1983, Phil became a founding partner of LaBelle and Harriman, now one of the largest retirement and business succession planning firms in New England. His community service includes serving on numerous boards, including chairperson of Make-A-Wish, Maine, and a trustee of Huston University. Phil's civic involvement includes serving four terms in the Maine State Senate. Phil also delivers political analysis for the NBC television network in his home state of Maine. And of course, it was because of Phil that we had on, we did a show actually on Make-A-Wish Maine just a few weeks ago with Katie Vickery, and that was just fantastic. Thank you for doing that. What a great yeah. organization Make-A-Wish is. Yeah, and Katie is a great leader. Mm. She just, uh, yeah, she was a wonderful guest. So Phil, tell us about your career and how you got into it in the first place. Well, again, I'm I'm honored that I could be part of the PR Maven podcast. Thank you again for having me. Uh, based on the dates that you shared with your audience that I started in the business, I won't go through my entire career. But I'll summarize it by saying uh, when I graduated from uh, Hudson University, my uh, dream at that point was to become the third generation to run our family's uh, supermarket business. We had several locations and I dreamed of succeeding my grandfather who transferred the business to my father and my uncle. And I was uh, so excited to become the third generation to run the business. And, um, you know, life happens sometimes. My dad was diagnosed uh, with a terminal illness and I was not prepared to run several supermarkets and the business was put up for sale and literally a year from graduating from college, I was looking for a new dream. And uh, our family had uh, uh, used uh, Sumner Bernstein of Bernstein Shore, one of the longstanding large law firms here in Maine. And Sumner Bernstein introduced me to uh, Governor Longley's firm. And 
I started in the financial services business back when, uh, again, this is going to tell my age, uh, we had a touch tone phone and the yellow pages to uh, look for potential clients. And uh, back then, the, the stockbrokers and the bankers and the insurance people were all in different silos, so to speak, primarily uh, promoting uh, uh, products that were proprietary to whoever was the manufacturer. And it just didn't seem right to me, Nancy, that every client financial uh, challenge or problem had a XYZ company solution. And so Mike LaBelle and I, back in 1983, decided that we were going to do things differently. We weren't going to represent manufacturers of financial instruments. We were going to represent the client. And so we terminated our relationship, started LaBelle and Harriman and all of our competitors. Uh, you'll be familiar with this, Nancy. There's a very famous part of the city of Portland called the Old Port. And if you walk down the streets of the Old Port, you'd see every brand name institution with its shingle out the door. And they predicted that uh, we had just cut our own throats and that we were going to be out of business in no time. And 43 years later, they're all gone, and I'm proud to say we're still here uh, doing better than ever. Well, you have a lot of notoriety in the state of Maine because you have built your personal brand, which is actually one of the topics that we like to talk about on the PR Maven podcast. So congratulations for building your personal brand as well as your Thank agency's you. brand. <laughs> And you mentioned the old port. I mean, where I am right now, I'm I'm on Middle Street. Um, Are you? Uh, <laughs> I, I had an office at 121 Middle Street. Are you near there? It, I was, I'm at 15 Middle Street. But okay. it's so funny because I was just talking with a young man this morning who lived at 121 Middle Street. It must be some kind of housing now. Yeah, they converted it into some very nice uh, private uh, housing. It at one time had a restaurant known as Carbers on the first floor, and then I remember that the second and third uh, floors were law firms and uh, accounting firms and uh, and our financial planning firm. Well, that's great. Well, I I can tell that uh, people would trust you, and I mean that's. I mean, people have to be able to trust someone who's advising on such an important topic. And of course, I'm sure it's more authentic because you really lived it. I mean, you thought you were going to take over your family business and then it vanished. And I can see how that, you know, you, you have a real heart driven mission to uh, help people. I do. I, I've had uh, the honor of working literally with hundreds of family businesses throughout New England and beyond. And, and you're right. I, I grew up listening to my uh, elders, so to speak, talk about various challenges of running a business. And one day it was about finance and the next day it was about inventory and the next day it was about advertising and then human resources. And I thought, you know, what a great skill set uh, that I could offer to potential clients to truly uh, understand what their day was like. They go from CFO to janitor in, in a heartbeat. And I dedicated myself to working with primarily family held businesses and nonprofits and helping them uh, prepare for the future, whether it was their retirement or their uh, sale or succession uh, of their family business. And I, I love it even more today. There, there are 10,000 people, Nancy, 10,000 people every day in America waking up to their 60th birthday. And that's a time in most people's <laughs> lives where they realize uh, more days are behind them than are in front of them. They think about, you know, what's my life been worth? Will my grandchildren or great grandchildren even know who I am? It's a time in their life where they realize that they've worked so hard to build something up and they really don't want to see it fall apart in the end. And, uh, and thank you for your kind words about uh, trustworthiness because I can't do my job unless you feel uh, that you can tell me what I need to know in a confidential way, knowing that there are no hot specials of the week and that my recommendations to help you in your in your business will stand the scrutiny of your attorney and your accountant and other trusted advisors. advisors. And there's never been a time where more people uh, need this sort of guidance. And I, I describe it as helping people align their heads their hearts and their stomachs. 
And <laughs> when people are aligned logistically, emotionally, and their instincts are all lined up, they can make and execute and implement life uh, defining decisions. Well, there's so much I want to react to. First of all, you obviously still feel the same passion, maybe even more for what you do. And I am exactly the same way. I just celebrated 30 years of my business. Oh, congratulations. And I'm like, why would I want to stop? I love this so much. And, you know, I like you, I, I've done it so long. I, I know how to do it. And I I really can help people. And it's like, I, there's no way I would want to stop doing this. I also have children who I have two sons who are in their 20s. They watched me grow my business because I started the business around the same time as I had them. And neither of them have any interest at all in doing what I do because they saw how all uh, absorbing it was. Mm -hmm. You know, they saw me on the phone, you know, morning, noon, and night, and emails and whatever else. And, uh, I remember Craig, who's now 28, like pulling on my shirt, mama, no more phone, no more phone. <laughs> <laughs> and so they both like working for other people. <laughs> uh, <laughs> but also, you know, you, you said no hot specials. And if you had stayed in the grocery business, you would have hot specials. <laughs> You'd have to come up with one every, every week. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, I mean, you probably are very steady. You kind of you offer a you don't you probably don't offer a package even it's just no. like you create a package based on what the client needs and yeah. i think that's very comforting to a client well i think that's probably similar to your profession as yes. it is to mine that everybody uh, has got a unique story and it's their story and it's not my place to judge their story or to tell them how the story should end but rather to make sure i fully understand back to my head heart analogy um, so often uh, business owners uh, turn to their accountant or their attorney and there's a good tax solution or a good legal solution, but sometimes it, does, it just doesn't feel right. And so they either abandon uh, the project or, or they, they find themselves uh, looking through the rear view mirror wishing they had done it differently. And I, I, I think what makes me unique is that I work with attorneys and accountants in my, in my work but first, I want the story. Then we'll go do math, and then we'll go do law. And to me, it's like putting together a puzzle on a foggy day, right? You empty the pieces on the table, and you turn them all upside, and you find the straight edges and the corner pieces and the clusters of colors. But the most important piece of the puzzle is the big picture on the box. And that I want to know what the big picture on the box is. Then we'll start putting financial and legal and other pieces of the puzzle together. I like that very much. And you said you have to align your head, your heart, your stomach. I would add the fourth piece as your checkbook. <laughs> because, <laughs> right. yeah. I mean, if you if there's money in the bank, there is a certain amount of comfort and security with that. But if right. you're starting with the, and I actually just submitted an article to Forbes.com about uh, having a bank account of goodwill and I talk about them public, in public that. relations. Well, if you if you have a strong reputation and you have a positive bank balance of goodwill, if if you do something that's kind of a little bad, you can withstand a withdrawal in that bank account and mm. you can recover. But if you start with a negative bank account of goodwill and you're already not very well thought of, and then you do something bad. <laughs> You might as well move out of yep, state. Or find a new career. Yeah, right. Exactly. <laughs> Change your name yeah. in these days, in this day of uh, search engine optimization. <laughs> <laughs> so, Phil, you are known for being able to help families and businesses solve financial and emotional challenges. How do you navigate through those family, business, and money issues? Uh, that's a that's a fabulous question because that is the secret to success. And what I have found is that in all family businesses, whether they're worth a billion or a million or a hundred thousand, there's a lot of similarities. And the similarities can range from the elephant in the room to the hidden agenda uh, to the night shift, as I describe it. Right, you go home from work and your your partner is giving you yet another perspective and opinion as to how things should unfold and 
what I do, I think, uniquely well is that I, I create a safe space for the individuals and I meet one on one and understand, not judge, but understand what those priorities are and where the pinch points are and where is the baggage and the emotional history and understanding all of those things is the most important piece because that will guide you to how you can give advice when everybody is together in the same room around the same table and everybody's got a different perspective and that's what makes this kaleidoscope of family businesses so so unique and for me professionally rewarding because there are solutions. There's a solution to all of these challenges. But if you don't have the knowledge and you don't have the trust of the client to tell you what you need to know, you can't give them good advice. And so for me, it is uncovering those uh, perspectives and make sure that people know that their confidence is assured, that uh, these conversations won't be the basis for a revisit to painful times in the past or uh, lost opportunities of today, but rather uh, we are where we are and we're going to go forward and we're going to do our best to make sure that everybody gets what they need and hopefully what they want. Right. And there are so many different options for a business, whether it's an ESOP or mm -hmm. a merger or an acquisition or sometimes, I don't know, is sometimes the best thing just to close the door? <laughs> And well, say it was a good run. <laughs> yeah, hopefully that hopefully that's not the ultimate. But I, I do work with a fair amount of uh, family businesses, Nancy, where the the next generation uh, is in a position of leadership, and they're not content personally or professionally. And and when you hear their story, it was well. You know, I did this because my last name is so and so, and that's what expected. That was what is, was expected of me. And they wake up and they're forty-five or fifty-five years old, and they got a mortgage and college tuition payments, and they're not fulfilled because they didn't follow their passion. Yeah, but when you talk to their parents, that's the last thing they want them to do. And and so making sure that. Uh, people are in the right place doing the thing that brings them joy, regardless of the money, uh, will prevent the ultimate decision to close the door. Right. And that brings the next question. Uh, family businesses are indeed rife with issues. And is there ever a time that it would be best for a family to sell the family business in order to preserve the family unit? Yes. Yes. Yeah. Uh, more, more and more each day. And what I uh, help clients think through is is the strategy to help the next generation to run the family business? And if so, let me go and find out that this is really what they want to do. And if so, let's manage the business day to day with that goal in mind. Uh, if the family business is not going to go on to the next generation, that's okay. Let's manage the business so that it becomes more and more attractive to an outside buyer. Because ultimately, when you decide to transition, whether it's to the next generation or to an outside new owner, uh, once you kind of reach consensus on the price, from there on, particularly if it's going to be sold to an outsider, they begin their due diligence, which is making sure there aren't, uh, you know, cobwebs and uh, skeletons in the closet and so forth. And, and that's a necessary part to do a due diligence. But once that process starts, the only way the price goes is down. <laughs> it doesn't go up. And so making sure that everybody, again, is aligned so that if we're going to sell it internally to the next generation, that's a very different strategy of how to run the business from today forward than if the business is going to be prepared to be sold to an outsider where we want the most attractive value possible. I can I can see that. Absolutely. And whoever is going to be taking the reins um, needs to be groomed to do so. Right. So it right. Needs to be and identified. Right. And, and the business from a human resource, technology, financial, all of those things uh, will take you in a different path if the business is going to be sold to the outside versus carried on from the inside. Right. I think banks do this particularly, particularly well as far as 
I mean, I work with with a, a bank that uh, that grooms its successors for quite a long time, maybe like like even fifteen years yeah. before they take 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 over. And I think that that's uh, probably a good thing to do. Having those conversations with the next generation early on is so important because t- this is typically the male business owner. Uh, has a tendency to keep all of these things close to the vest. They probably built it from nothing and it's part of who they are and who they are becoming. Meanwhile, the next generation is in not in the know. They're not uh, sure which way dad is going to uh, make decisions. And so the more that that communication can be opened and transparent, the more success the business will have and the family outside of business will have with each other. Right. And in my mind, it's more important to maintain family harmony and unity than to run a business. You know, right. the, the business it. should serve the family, not right. the other way around. Right, right. <laughs> Phil, how have you used public relations and media relations to get the word out about what you do? I feel like this is something you've done very well. Well, I, I probably... Um, could have done a lot better. Frankly, it's it's hard to build a, a marketing strategy around clients that are you know very confidential. You, you, you can't put out an ad or a, a media piece that says LaBelle and Harriman is now the advisor to X Y Z conglomerate. So right, our strategy has been more about uh, building individual relationships using the opportunity to share with others, whether it's accounting firms or chambers of commerce or uh, networking groups to uh, join in conversations about the work that we do, not based on who we are and how long we've been around, but rather talking about on a, on a no-name basis, some of the interesting experiences we've had. And surprisingly, Nancy, and you see this more in your business than I do, those ideas that you are able to share with a potential client, you know, kind of creates an aha moment. <laughs> and, and that leads to, well, how do you go about doing that? Right. <laughs> and, and thus, uh, hopefully begins the beginning of a very long term relationship. Well, uh, I wrote a book actually at the beginning of the pandemic called Grow Your Audience, Grow Your Brand. And it was essentially all about how, you know, if the the larger your network of personal and professional connections, the larger the audience or platform that you'll have and the larger your brand will be. And um, so actually, that's what I was going to talk about right now, because we're going to take a break. And uh, people who are listening can go to PRMaven.com slash giveaway and download a free copy of that book grow your audience, grow your brand. <laughs> so there we go. That was a per- perfect segue. Awesome. So we're <laughs> we're going to take a short break now. We'll be back with more from Phil Harriman in just a moment. Do you want to grow your client or customer base? Perhaps increase brand awareness? Maybe tell your unique story more effectively? Of course you do. But you may be worried that you don't have enough expertise to make that happen. Well, no worries, PR Maven Nation. Let the PR maven herself, Nancy Marshall, show you how easy it is to get your message across effectively using a powerful yet simple tool, a message map. Nancy's training is often called informative and constructive, well-designed and impactful, with a perfect blend of theory and real-life experience. You will leverage Nancy's expertise to create your own message map when you register for this comprehensive, online video training course, which is broken down into four easy to understand modules. Normally this course is priced at $147, but for listeners of the PR Maven podcast, that's you PR Maven nation. It's only $29 when you enter the code word podcast during enrollment. It even includes a workbook and bonus content to guide you through the process. So go to prmaven.com and click on the Message Map Mastery course to enroll today. Remember, enter the word podcast during enrollment for a special discounted price of $29. 
Welcome back. And it's nice to be here with Phil Harriman. And Phil, I'd love to show you sometime about that message mapping technique, because I think it could be really helpful to people who are selling a business to explain it, not only to their own family or their employees, but also to the public. So I, I, thank you. I would welcome that. <laughs> So, Phil, you served on the Yarmouth Town Council and four terms in the Maine Senate. What was that like? <laughs> oh, a lot, a lot of work. Uh, well, first, it was a, a tremendous honor to uh, serve in public office. I, I wish more and more people could experience what that's like. Uh, I wish more people in the legislature and in Congress had run a business so they would know what that is like. Uh, I, I found serving at the local level. I grew up in Yarmouth, Maine. I, I still live there and serving on the town council was an experience where one item on the agenda was, uh, you know, sanitation recycling issues. And the next one was spending tens of millions of dollars on public buildings and police and sidewalks and on and on and on I could go. And that experience was every time you met, people could come and look you in the eye and listen to the debate, offer their public opinion, and then react to how you vote. It is truly government that is closest to the people. When I had the honor of being elected to the, the main Senate, I realized that not only was I responsible for the, the constituents who elected me, I also had an obligation to my entire state. And the legislative process, unlike municipal government, where I served with six other people, in the legislature, I served with 185 other people, 151 in the, in the main house and 35 in the main Senate. And that uh, process, as you know from your time uh, there, is, is very complicated, very messy. And then there's another layer put on top of it, which is everything is done by parliamentary procedure. So if you don't understand the language of parliamentary procedure, you cannot be an effective uh, legislator. And to, <laughs> I think, I'm guessing, but I wouldn't be surprised if when I was in the, the Senate, I was there uh, four terms, that I probably wrestled with 10 to 12,000 great new ideas to run our lives called pieces of legislation. And probably 80 to 85 percent of all of the bills that work their way through the main House and Senate are uh, resolved without acrimony. But that doesn't make for good news uh, stories. So the public tends to hear about the 10 or 15 percent of those pieces of legislation that are that are uh, complicated or controversial. And it was in that arena where I, I had to deal with things coming at me, literally walking down the hallway from uh, the House and Senate to the governor's office. You would cross paths with people pushing, persuading, uh, begging for votes, right. various issues and every step was a different person and a different issue. And somehow you had to keep up uh, to speed with, with all of those issues because you were going to read about it in the newspaper or you were going to see it on the television or hear it on the radio. And that to me was the most challenging part was making sure that I was well informed on the issues, that I was clear in my position and then being able to understand how the constituents who would hear it, see it, or read it, uh, how I needed to be prepared to respond to their uh, either criticisms or compliments. Well, that shows that you're think you're forward thinking because I can tell that you know legislation is typically highly complex. And then people will throw other things into legislation <laughs> to serve their own purposes. And then the news media, of course, wants to boil all of this down into simple sound bites or simple messages, right. like, like what we do in our message mapping. Right. So, <laughs> so taking a highly complex piece of legislation that has uh, you know, a lot of different aspects to it uh, and then communicating it through especially broadcast media um, is, is really challenging. And I know that oftentimes the broadcast media will pick up the most controversial aspect of that because that, that 
seems the most newsworthy and will draw the most attention. <laughs> absolutely, absolutely right. And they've got maybe two minutes on television and, you know, maybe half a oh, page yes. in the news story. And they're trying to present to the readers the most important pieces of what could be um, bills that are, you know, 10, 20 pages long. Right. <laughs> Well, I'm sure that that experience has uh, helped to serve you in your in your primary business of serving family owned businesses. And how do you advise family owned businesses when they're branding and promoting themselves? Wow, another great question. <laughs> I, I would uh, say um, what I try to do is to help clients communicate either to a legislator or a customer or a potential new market um, to begin uh, with why. Why do Simon, we do Simon, Like Simon Sinek's book. Yes, 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 uh -huh. yes. Why? Tell us why you do this. Because if people don't understand what your passion in is, what you are good at and what you're proud of and what needs you satisfy, they they really uh, aren't going to be as eager to engage with you, regardless of your location or your product. So I, I, I encourage clients to uh, explain why they are so passionate about what they do. And when people who have the same passion or are curious about the same product, they're going to come find you because you stand out as being proud of why you do what you do. Yeah, it's funny. I our former governor and current U.S. Senator Angus King once told me that enthusiasm trumps intelligence every time. <laughs> That's true. It is. Yeah. And, uh, you know, people want you to feel enthusiastic about, about them, essentially. You right. Know, for them right. to hire you. Well, I, I feel that if, if people are going to share with me their most sensitive issues about their family and business and money, and they're going to entrust me with helping them build that dream to reality and entrust me with handling their, their finances, um, your passion and your commitment and your professionalism should speak for itself just in the way that you, you communicate with them. Right. Yeah, I can see that. So you can tell, uh, you can tell very easily how somebody approaches their business by how they describe it. I, I, I open the door and take two steps into a, a potential client's business. And I can tell almost immediately from the tone of voice of the receptionist to the atmosphere in the, in the workplace, uh, what type of potential uh, business they are. Yeah, of course, in today's world, now you have to look at their website and their <laughs> social media <laughs> to be able to tell. But I think that all of those things online tell a story as well. They do, but that's yeah. the high, t high tech part. Uh, people, I think, more and more want the high touch to come along with it. Right, exactly. Yeah, they have to be in alignment. That's that's going back to that head and heart and stomach piece. <laughs> and check <laughs> Yeah, Yeah, checkbook, right. <laughs> so your firm has in place second and third generation future leadership. How have you managed to accomplish that? Uh, I would uh, say without hesitation, my proudest professional uh, achievement is not only starting this firm with my partner, Mike LaBelle, uh, to assuring my clients who have entrusted us with their affairs for 30 or 40 years uh, that there is already uh, a team of people in place who understand their story and are already up to speed on the plans that they, they have made with us. And to do that, um, I'm exceptionally proud of the fact that our firm is now uh, run by uh, three very capable women, four very capable women, and uh, one, uh, I'll just use first names, Lori has been with us for more than 30 years, Rebecca more than 20 years, uh, Michelle almost 20 years, and uh, Jennifer has been with us for almost 15 years. And so to attract the caliber of professional people that we have and that they have decided to make their career here with LaBelle and Harriman is, is uh, so rewarding. And I'm very proud of the fact that the firm is going to carry on uh, long after my days are done. 
and there's yet another generation behind them of young professionals who are in their uh, late 20s, early 30s, who have already dedicated themselves to this, not only this profession, but they've been with us for five years or more. Well, that's a sign of strong leadership. So you should feel very proud of that. Thank you. Thank <laughs> that's you. great. So is there a book, an app, or a website that you have found helpful personally and professionally and why? Oh, so, so many. Um, I, I, I have found that uh, the readings of, of, of history of people who have accomplished things, whether they're an athlete or a, a politician or an inventor, uh, uh, inspires me today because it, it, I've learned that reading about people and not just because of who they've become, but rather understanding how difficult it was to become that book worthy person. And I've learned that uh, success in life uh, is uphill. Anything that you want to accomplish is not a downhill ski. It's a climb the mountain every yeah. single uh, day. Uh, I find that frankly, the invention of the cell phone was probably the most remarkable communication device, uh, at least for me, to uh, network with people and be introduced to potential clients. You used to have to dial the touchtone phone or drop coins in a, <laughs> a telephone pay It's hard to believe, I know. Right, right. And first you had to get through the person who answered the phone, and then you had to get through the secretary to the person that you wanted to talk to. Uh, today, all those walls have come down. You can very easily have the opportunity to reach directly out to someone who you would like to have a, a business or a personal relationship with. Right. Or both. Oh, yeah. <laughs> yeah, I remember working. I'm holding up my phone here. I remember working with U.S. Cellular back in the late 90s, uh, you know, when when we had bag phones. I remember those with, bag phones? Yeah, and it came, it's about the size of two bricks. Right? <laughs> it came with a magnet that you put on your car and it took both hands and your foot <laughs> And it was also very expensive to yes. make a call. <laughs> yeah, so I mean, one call could end up costing you fifty or sixty dollars without right. you even knowing it. Right. So I remember U.S. Cellular at that time saying that these devices are going to change our lives, and boy, have they! I mean, I don't know about you, but I would rather lose my wallet than lose myself. Uh, well, I think it's astonishing <laughs> that there's more computing power technology and a greeting card that opens up and sings a song or what have you than there was that put a man on the moon. And if you think, <laughs> think of this, that today, and you can go anywhere on the planet and slide a plastic card into a device and find out what your bank balance is and withdraw cash in any international currency in less than two minutes. Uh, I know. So if, you, if you look back and see where we've been and we, where we are today, how exciting is it to think about where we're going to be in another generation? Yeah, we need to embrace the technology. I know, uh, you know, when I, in my early days, I worked at Sugarloaf in public relations and marketing. And my boss at the time, Chip Carey, used to always be saying to me, you got to stay on top of this technology. It's really going to have a great impact uh, impact on communications. And and I did take it to heart. And, and when he was saying that to me, we were really just talking about databases, not even computers. I mean, he taught me, you know, how to use DBase 3 plus to, to create oh, a wow. database. Yeah. <laughs> but, you know, that's how we, our marketing database was very detailed so we could call up you know, all the people from Connecticut who are interested in Nordic skiing or people from Massachusetts and are interested in golf or, you know, all the different combinations. And and then when social media and websites came along, he was like, you got to stay on top of this. And it was just a very good lesson because I find now that especially people who are nearing the end of their career, if they do check out of technology and say, oh, that's for young people, or, you know, I'm, I'm not going to do that social media stuff or that, that's not, you might as well just totally retire then yeah. because you're out of it. If, if you you're are. not, if, if you're not at least trying now, it's impossible to know everything about every, every app or every social platform, but you've got to make an effort to, to learn it. Even like TikTok, you know, 
I have a TikTok account. I, I don't post on it, but you know, it, I think it's important or Snapchat, or you just have to kind of have an idea of what these things are because yeah. they're different ways to connect people and communicate. Yeah, no question about it. And I think it's also fair to say that these technology tools also creates a level playing field. It doesn't matter whether you are JP Morgan or LaBelle and Harriman, you can be presented to the public through social media uh, as a, a uh, you know, a competent source of financial information. In my I opinion. agree. I agree. Absolutely. And, uh, you know, using, again, building your personal brand by, by creating thought leadership content and putting it out there. Yes, you and I can be every, every bit as impactful as the president of the United States or, or whoever. <laughs> 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 just have to keep working at it. <laughs> well, Phil, this has been fantastic. If people want to connect with you, how should they follow up? Oh, thank you. That's, you are the PR maven. Thank you. <laughs> uh, you, can, uh, you can reach me at uh, P. Harriman at LaBelle, and that's spelled L-E-B-E-L, uh, Harriman.com. LaBelle is the same forward and backwards. L E B E L. P Harriman. Oh, that's cool. <laughs> that's a totally <laughs> cool thing. Well, Phil, this has been really enjoyable. Oh, and I want to thank you for your time. I know we had one false start a few weeks ago, and I'm glad yes. that we were able to reschedule. Uh, well, and I, I want to, in front of all of your audience, apologize. I had a, a technology <laughs> upgrade that didn't uh, synchronize with my phone, and I do apologize to you and your audience, and I'm so uh, grateful that you uh, found a way to bring me back another time. And uh, this has been awesome. Thank you very much. I really appreciate this. Yeah, I've enjoyed it. And uh, hopefully everybody at PR Maven Nation enjoys it too. And I look forward to staying in touch and, and getting together with you in person. I can't wait. <laughs> okay. All the best to you, Nancy. Thanks. You too, Phil. Have a great day. Thanks. And have a great day, PR Maven Nation. We'll see you again in a couple of weeks. Thanks for listening to this episode of the PR Maven podcast. I invite you to share a review of the podcast on iTunes or your favorite podcast player. Be sure to subscribe to our podcast so you never miss an episode. You can also join the PR Maven Nation on Facebook. It's free to join and it's a great community of like-minded individuals who are all looking to learn and grow from one another. If you use an Alexa device, use your Alexa app to search the skills and games section to find and enable the PR Maven podcast flash briefing. This will give you access to exclusive content and more PR and marketing advice. Thanks again for listening and have a great rest of your week, PR Maven Nation.